You could ask what is the force that this motor exerts during a single step and the force for kinesin is roughly of the order of 10 piconewton. So, these are not small forces uh, piconewton order forces which in the context of these nanometer sized objects are pretty large forces that these motors exert. Another another characterization another quantity that you can use to characterize motors is their processivity. And what processivity means is that how long does a motor walk before it unbinds from the filament and falls off ok. So, these motors are walking on the filament, these motors are walking on the filament, but before they walk they need to come and bind to this, they need to come and bind to this filament right. So, it binds with some rates let us say k on, but similarly once a motor is bound and it is carrying a cargo, it can also unbind with some rates. So, the typical sort of distance that a motor covers before it unbinds from this filament is what is called its processivity and different motors have different processivities. For example, RNA polymerase is a highly processive motor it needs to walk thousands of bases basically it needs to walk the entire length of the gene uh, before it needs it can unbind because if it unbound in the middle then you would get partial transcripts which are of no use to you. So, an RNA polymerase once it binds stays bound until typically the gene is completely red. So, it is a highly processive motor. On the other hand if you in the other extreme if you consider uh, muscle myosin, so myosin that are found in muscles uh, the actin fibers in muscles, um, they are not very processive at all they just take 2 3 steps before they unbind from the actin filaments ok. And you can have a, a anywhere in between for example, dynines are more processive than kinesins and so on. So, that is another measure that you can use to characterize this motor properties. So, the force exerted is sort of a measure of how much force would you typically need to bring this motor to a stop ok. So, what this means is that for kinesins typically you would need 10 piconewton force to completely stop this motor and I will I will show a diff slightly different context where this force measured sorry this force exerted has a more direct uh, sort of meaning. Now, let us focus a little bit on let us say this kinesins and dynines. So, here I have a microtubule right it has a minus end and a plus end. So, this is my microtubule and I have some cargo right which needs to be transported. Uh, I know that uh, a kinesin if it attaches to this cargo will tend to walk towards the plus end. On the other hand if I had a dynein bound to this cargo, oh, let me draw, draw it. If I had a dynein bound to this cargo it would try to move towards the minus end ok. Typically a cargo will have multiple motors bound to it and not necessarily of the same type. So, it could have multiple kinesins bound as well as multiple dynines bound ok. If you had <coughs> multiple kinesins as well as dynines bound to this cargo, what sort of motion would I see if I observe this cargo as a whole? Would it move towards the plus end or would it move towards the minus end? So, what these cargos typically do is what is called as bidirectional motion. So, if you see the uh, these dots, these fluorescent dots, these are cargos. If you will see, there are cargos that are moving sometimes, oh god, sometimes moving this way and then sometimes moving back in the other way, right. So, there is a single cargo, depend and then depending on something, we do not really understand completely uh, what it depends on. It will sometimes move in this direction, it will sometimes move in the other direction. But yet, so and most cargos are going to be bound by both kinesins and dynines. So, it is not that generally only one or the other is bound. And what these movies show is that uh, these cargos will typically do some sort of a bidirectional, sometimes it will move this way, sometimes it will move back that way. And yet, somehow the cell sort of manages to 
deliver cargo very uh, very reliably to where it needs to go right and in the time scales that it needs to go in. So, even though there are both types of motors that are bound let us say your cargo has been produced here and it needs to go here in some amount of time the cell will generally every time get you there even though the underlying motion might look very noisy uh, bi directional sort of motion. The macroscopic results are fairly robust uh, and the mechanism of that also is not very clear how the cell regulates this sort of bi directional transport in order to reliably achieve directed motion in the presence of these sort of opposing motors like kinesins and dynins is not very clear. But at least at a microscopic level this is what the cargo does it executes bi directional motion where it moves sometimes this way and sometimes that. You can see it also over here this is uh, I think a uh, mouse experiments on a mouse neuron where it again shows this sort of bi directional motion ok. Now, you can think of this motors in a slightly different context. Uh, for example, instead of bind instead of binding a cargo like this what it could do in principle is that you have this motor one end is bound to the microtubule, the other end is bound to another microtubule let us say, but let us say in the reverse direction. So, these would generally be sort of complexes. So, this leg wants to these are kinesins let us say. So, this leg wants to walk in this direction, this leg wants to walk in this direction ok. They these because these are kinesins they both want to walk towards the plus end of the microtubule. So, in a setup like this what would you observe? you would observe sort of sliding of these microtubules relative to each other right. So, if you have these sort of doublet microtubules you can have sliding of these microtubules relative to each other uh, which way they slide depends on the relative orientation of these microtubules whether they are parallel or anti parallel ok. You could also imagine that this sort of walking causes bending of these microtubule structures uh, oops. So, if you have these sort of two microtubules on which these motors are walking on which these motors are walking but you also introduce some sort of chemical cross links between them you also introduce some sort of chemical cross links at certain positions. So, that these motors so that these filaments cannot slide against each other then what this sort of walking will do is that it will produce local bend it will produce local bending of these structures. So, these are contexts in which directly these sort of motors can apply force and this force can result either in sliding or in uh, sort of this bending of these structures. So, these are not typical cargo uh, binding scenarios of these motors, but scenarios where these motors bind two filaments either parallel or anti parallel or indeed a bunch of filaments. So, it can cause sliding, it can cause bending. Another the one of the most common examples of the roles of this uh, sort of motor motion comes in this uh, context of muscles uh, and in muscles the relevant fiber is actually actin and the motor is myosin. So, instead of kinesins or dynins uh, it is actin it is uh, myosins walking on actin. So, here is my muscle well, somebody's muscle and as you flex it you know the muscle fibers move. So, if you zoom inside this muscle what you find is that uh, the basic unit is what is called the basic muscle cell in some sense is what is called the sarcomere. Um, so, here is one sarcomere and then this sort of sarcomere structure repeats to form your muscle. Inside this sarcomere you will have this two sorts of filaments a thick red one this is called the thick myofilament and this thinner orange ones which are called the thin myofilaments ok. So, this orange ones are called the thin myofilaments. What happens when you contract or expand the muscle is that these two the thick and the thin myofilaments slide against each other. So, here is if you zoom in even further the thick myofilaments are nothing but 
thousands and thousands of myosin motors ok all bunched up into a filament with only the myosin head domain which binds to this actin that being free. So, I have this ok let me watch the movie. Over here the thin myofilaments are what are your actins ok and this myosin heads these go and bind to the actins ok. They walk along the actin, but because the myosins are formed into this thick fundle bundle this myosins themselves do not move, but these actins actually slide ok relative to this myosin bundle. So, when this actin head uh, sorry when this myosin head executes what is called as a power stroke. So, it takes in ATP it converts that ATP into ADP plus energy and it takes a stroke. So, let us see I think this is what it will show. So, it gets activated by absorbing ATP and it forms a cross bridge with this actin fiber. that is the release of the inorganic phosphate. Once it is uh, formed a cross bridge, it will execute a power stroke which means it will. So, it releases the ADP as well. Uh, it executes a power stroke so like this. So, it slides this uh, actin filament relative to this myosin filament and then it sort of release this bond releases which is called the cross bridge it releases and then it gets reactivated again to walk once more. So, ATP binds again and it releases this bond and then the cycle will keep on repeating ok. So, this thick myofilament is so, I have these actin heads and let me say this actin bodies. So, sorry myosin so, these are all my myosin motors ok. The bodies of these act myosin motors all bunch up together to form this thick myofilament to form this thick myofilament. What is what is visible are these heads of these motors of these myosin motors and these heads walk along this actin filament over here this helical actin filament over here. As it walks on this actin filament there is a relative sliding of the actin relative to this uh, thick myofilament and that causes uh, this movement of the this sort of relative sliding that causes the contraction and expansion of the muscles. Uh, this is sort of governed by the release of calcium ions. So, why does it not always walk that is because the myosin binding domain on this actin that is not always visible to the myosin. It gets visible only when calcium ions come and bind and it causes a sort of structural change in this actin filaments. So, this uh, sort of motion of this uh, these molecular motors like myosin on these actin filaments is what underlies this uh, muscle movement any sort of muscle movement. So, this is just that same thing, but uh, in terms of pictures. So, these are my thick filaments over here and you can see the myosin heads and then there are these thin filaments on which these myosins walk as they walk they produce a relative sliding of the thin relative to the thick filaments and that is how your muscles contract. So, this whole thing is one sarcomere and then this structure is repeated n number of times to form a complete muscle. One more context where these uh, actins and myosins exert forces comes in the uh, context of cell division. So, this was the spindle formation by microtubules, but once the micro once this uh, the chromosomes have been separated out for example, over here there is an actin ring that forms in the center of the cell along with myosin filaments which walk on these actin rings on these actin filaments. This actin actomyosin ring rather this actomyosin ring is contractile. So, it slowly pinches off the middle of the cell until it you form two daughter cells basically from a single cell. So, this contractility is again a function of these myosin motors walking on the actin filaments. So, the same sort of underlying biology motors walking on filaments. So, this sort of translational uh, motors underlie a lot of di very different phenomena cargo transport which is straightforward, but also this sort of cell division or muscle movement uh, 
uh, muscle contraction and so on. So, very different very different macroscopic phenomenon, but the underlying biology is uh, very similar. So, you have these motors walking on these filaments. A nice way to visualize uh, this sort of forces that these motors exert on the filaments comes in the form of these gliding assay experiments. So, where you take a glass slide and you fix your motors onto the glass slides and then you throw in a bunch of filaments let us say actin filaments. So, if these motors were myosins then you throw in a bunch of actin filaments. Because these motors are fixed to the glass slide the motors themselves cannot move, but what you will see is motion of these actin filaments as a whole right. So, these are called gliding assays and so here for example, is a typical gliding assay what you are, you are seeing are these actin filaments that are moving. It seems they are moving on their own, but what is happening is that underneath which we cannot see are these myosin motors. They are walking along these actin filaments causing a um, uh, sort of sliding of these actin filaments relative to the cover slip. This is a somewhat dilute system. So, you have very few sort of actin uh, filaments and so on. You can make this uh, very concentrated for example. Uh, and you get very interesting phenomenon. So, for example, uh, this is an experiment done with uh, again actin and myosin similar sort of experiment, but extremely high density now ok. So, what you are seeing again you are not seeing the motors what you are seeing are simply the filaments, but now m m at a much higher density than in the previous experiment and you see these very beautiful patterns that form and merge and then dissolve and you have uh, different vorticities that arise. So, this is a collective sort of motion of these actin filaments because of the coupling with this underlying motors walking on these filaments. It can give rise to a variety of phenomena at different scales depending on the densities and so on. So, that is one sort of way to visualize the effect of the interactions of the motors with these filaments, these gliding assays. You could also do sort of um, single motor assays in which you observe a single bead being moving along a track whether it be microtubule or actin. So, for example, uh, if you can see these are this is a bead for example, this is a kinesin experiment if I remember correctly. So, it is moving on microtubules uh, and you will see that the bead sort of attaches and then it moves along the microtubule after some time it will detach and go off. So, one sort of thing that you can ask from these experiments for example, is how do these motors walk along the how do these motors walk along the uh, underlying microtubule or active. 